Greetings from the German capital once again and a warm welcome to our highlights of the week that are lining up this time with the following stories. Talk of the town, a Belgian designer makes a splash at Paris Fashion Week. On the road again, an iconic French car makes a comeback in wood. And design classic, an Italian storage unit turns 50. Well, Paris is the city of fashion on any given day, but this past week more than ever as the Pret-a-Porter shows showcase the trends for next spring and summer. Now, one show in particular was eagerly awaited, that of the French fashion label Y Project. Head designer Glenn Martins is a protégé of the one and only Jean-Paul Gaultier, which certainly shows in his creations, which are like a hybrid of streetwear and elegant couture. And we caught up with him backstage. <laughs> With barely an hour to go before his latest creations hit the catwalk, 33-year-old Glenn Martins flits around backstage, nipping and tucking and making sure everything fits perfectly, right to the last second. I even used to put on sunglasses because I'd be so nervous about the show. I didn't want anyone to see my eyes and realize how terrorized and stressed I was. But he need not have worried. Everything's going very nicely for him right now. Recently, Glenn Martins won the coveted Andame Fashion Award with its cash purse of 250,000 euros. Intended to give talented young designers a boost, the award was based in part on these creations. That's cool because the jury that bestows the award is made up of key figures in the fashion industry. And I tell myself, if they thought I deserved this award, that amounts to a wonderful confirmation. Glenn Martins has been creative director of the French Y Project label since 2013. He creates fashions for both men and women. Some of his pieces are unisex. His very latest women's collection is among his most adventurous. Coat dresses with trains. Shorts wrapped in organza. Spiral stilettos. Shirts with four sleeves. And pant legs that show skin. What I'm aiming for is to show a person's various sides. We all have several facets. Sometimes you're more a business person, sometimes more a lover or a partier. You should give expression to these different moods. Whether sexy, classical or streetwear, often you can achieve that with a single piece of clothing. When you're in that frame of mind and you put on your look, the person and the outfit become a unified whole. Glenn Martin's approach to constructing and deconstructing items of clothing has roots that run deep. Before he attended the Fashion Academy in Antwerp, he completed his studies in architecture. He draws inspiration from historical buildings and personalities. My father often took me to visit churches and chateaus and taught me about history. I was totally fascinated by it as a child. When I started to draw, I always sketched historical figures like Napoleon, Cleopatra, and Marie Antoinette. Their clothing was very important for me because I knew clothes make the man. These influences can still be found in my collections today, even though they're modern. His designs are historical and avant-garde all at once. The skirt made from blue nylon is reminiscent of Marie Antoinette and the Renaissance, but the idea behind it is that it's three skirts in one, and that gives it a certain volume. Martin's ingenious combinations have won over the fashion world in Paris. Critics here rave about his extravagant creations. He has this uh, classic touch uh, from the painting from the ancient period, but with a streetwear twist. And I find this one of the most innovative brands because of this kind of uh, mix that he, can, he made it. Actually, it's not streetwear, it's not couture, but it's something new that I always, I'm always curious to see. I've watched it evolve, you know, in his own collection and ever since he started Y Project. In the beginning, it was tough the first couple of seasons, 
But it was great watching it, his signature get stronger and stronger. Like he is one of the rare designers now that has a signature. And it's um, playing with volumes, playing with his history, playing with graphics. He's great. Celebrities have also discovered Glenn Martins. R&B singer Rihanna is also a fan. So are top models Bella and Gigi Hadid. Maybe they'll find the perfect outfit in his latest collection. But right now, Glenn Martins is simply glad the show's over and he's off to celebrate with his team. And from streetwear to street art, which has finally found its rightful home here in the German capital, Urban Nation is a new addition to Berlin's museum landscape that aims to help bring street artists to the next level in public awareness. And so it commissioned a number of works for its opening exhibition to create some street art with staying power that people can then recognize outside. Street art is ephemeral. Meter-high artworks that grace entire facades aren't made for eternity. The buildings can get torn down or repainted. So, legal or not, street art is transitory by nature. Now the Urban Nation Museum in Berlin is out to bring street art indoors. It's one of the world's first permanent museums for contemporary urban art. But can art born on the street really work in a museum? Street art belongs on the street and should stay there. Here at the Urban Nation Museum, we asked 130 artists who normally decorate building walls to come up with an artwork measuring 1 meter by 1 meter 50 for the museum. But at the same time, we will continue to work with these artists on large outdoor projects. The aesthetics and styles of various street artists are now captured on canvas. This helps visitors identify the artist's work out on the street. I'm surprised to see street art in a museum. Expectations were high, but uh, no, it's amazing. Like, the, the collection is... Wow. I have great respect for the people who organized this, getting the people together and the artists. Creative director Yasha Young spent two years working with nine other curators around the globe to select the artists for the project. The exhibition showcases urban contemporary art, giving a relatively young genre a place in art history. But the new museum wants to be more than just an exhibition space. The museum's aim is to create a repository for urban art. The first exhibition provides insights into the developments, techniques, styles and diversity of urban art. The Urban Nation Museum also showcases artists who work in different genres. Like Berlin-based artist Mimi S. The former street artist now works digitally in a studio, but it's still clear where her roots are. It's an honor for me to be represented here, to be here as an illustrator and digital artist or digital painter with a relatively new medium that isn't so widely accepted and only recently found a degree of recognition. I fought for 10 years for this, so the feeling is indescribable. With its framed canvases and orderly structure, the current exhibition seems like ones found in conventional museums. However, the building's architectural design will provide plenty of space for experimental shows in the future. The building is flexible enough for us to paint entire walls that are 20 meters high. We can paint the facade or remove it and add new elements to it. The inaugural exhibition runs until next summer. Then the exhibits will make way for new works of street art. But no fear, rather than being destroyed, the outgoing pieces will be stored for posterity. 
Well, it's a veritable legend in automotive history. The Citroën 2CV, known as the Deux Chevaux in French and lovingly nicknamed in German Ente, which means duck. Well, the relatively inexpensive French car was first unveiled in Paris in 1948. And at the time, it captured the hearts of a nation still recovering from the ravages of war. Well, it's still a much-loved model today, with such symbolic flair that one carpenter in central France has paid homage to it like no one before him. This Citroën 2CV, or De Chevaux, is made of wood. But you can still drive it. After five years of work, the car's maker, Michel Dorbia, is taking it out on its maiden voyage through the medieval town of Loche. This is the first time it's been on the streets of France, in Loche. I feel like a kid. Except that instead of getting a little bicycle, I've got a little car. The idea was to build a deux chevaux, not any other car. I had my heart set on building a deux chevaux. Earlier, the wooden deux chevaux was unveiled in Loche Central Square. The whole town came out to see it. The local priest even blessed the car with holy water. It's a means of locomotion that brings people together. It connects and unites them. And that's the role of the gospel too. The 2CV is a legendary automobile in France. It was in production for 40 years. So it's a very nice idea to build a replica out of wood. The Deux Chevaux is a symbol of French joie de vivre, the art of enjoying life to the fullest. Michel's great adventure began five years ago with this 2CV. Built in 1953, it was just rusting away in a barn. I came here thousands of times with my pencil, my meter stick and paper to take all the measurements. Then the retired carpenter began creating the car out of wood in his workshop, based on blueprints that he'd sketched. I assembled everything, piece by piece. I mounted a platform on the chassis of a deux chevaux. Then I constructed my frame on top. And then I had to adapt the doors, the hood and the wings to fit the standard body shell. Michel fashioned his car from the wood of a variety of fruit trees. Whether pear, apple, walnut, or cherry trees, he used only ones from the Loire Valley. Installing the 16-horsepower engine was one of the easier tasks. Faithfully reproducing the different parts of the car's body was incredibly time-consuming. This piece of wood here, these air intakes, took me three days of work. No machine can do this, so I had to do everything by hand. But time wasn't an issue for me. It didn't matter if I needed four or five years, I just wanted to make a model that was unique. Michelle is something of an expert at making wooden cars, but one to ten scale model ones. He exhibits them in a little museum, which he opens to visitors. His wooden de chevaux is now the main exhibit and his masterpiece. You can make hundreds of little wooden models like this from all makes of cars, but building a full-scale model like this is something you only do once in a lifetime. There won't be a second time. Now that the sawing and sanding is done, Michel plans to spend the coming years showing off the fruits of his labor. But 
Michel has even bigger plans for his wooden car. I want to exhibit it in art galleries and the big museums on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Maybe even at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Michel Robillard knows that his car is a real attraction. After all, people were drawn to it from the moment the wooden de chevaux made its debut in the streets of Loche. Well, eight levels over five floors. It doesn't even sound like that's possible, and yet it was so intriguing that we made the trip to Edinburgh, Scotland, to visit the Murphy House. Now, British architect Richard Murphy took 10 years to make his dream home a reality, and it seems that it was indeed worth the wait. Last year, he raked in six awards, including the Reba House of the Year Prize, as a fine example of how to overcome challenging spatial constraints. This house is full of surprises. Sliding or pivoting panels transform each space. They can be found throughout the entire structure. This is the Murphy House, designed and owned by architect Richard Murphy. In 2016, it was named House of the Year by the Royal Institute of British Architects. There are lots of ideas behind this house, how it fits into a piece of historic Edinburgh, how it changes between winter and summer, how you get a lot of rooms into a very small space, how you save energy, and how an architect really brings to bear his own influences and interests of other architects he's studied. It's quite a limited volume of space, so the shape of the house came from that, building up high on one side and low on the other. Uh, and then trying to, as I say, get as lots of many rooms in there as possible and using various devices to make the house feel bigger than it actually is. The Murphy House and its unique architecture certainly stands out in Edinburgh's popular Newton district. Most of the houses here were built in the 19th century and represent the world's largest example of uninterrupted Lake Georgian architecture. Murphy House has eight levels spread over five storeys with 140 square metres of living space. It took Richard Murphy a total of 10 years to build his house, from seeing the site, drawing up the plans, to getting the building permits. The master bedroom is located on the top floor and also contains large movable panels. Here too, there is an element of surprise. It's a small house and space is a premium, but I wanted to have a bath somewhere in the house, so I thought, why don't I put a bath in the bedroom, but I disguised it uh, as a seat. This is a panel which opens up between the bedroom and the living room. I mean, one does things for different reasons. Sometimes you do them for functional reasons, and sometimes you do them for a piece of fun. And this is more of a piece of fun so that when you're in the bedroom, you can talk to people down in the living room if you want to. The reason it's designed like this, which is an eccentric pivot, is because you don't want to be able to see straight ahead, because if you saw straight ahead, you'd be able to see from the bed into the neighbours' windows, which is not such a clever idea. There was a long period of time when it looked like the Murphy House would never be built. After a lot of wrangling with the planning department, they actually recommended refusal. But I went and talked to um, a couple of local councillors who were on the planning committee and they understood what I was trying to do. And they talked to other councillors and when we got to the committee meeting, the councillors overturned the recommended refusal of the planning department, which is extremely rare. The house doesn't really blend in, so what do the neighbours think? Uh, they all complained, of course, or lots of them did anyway. And there was a bit of a campaign, uh, but almost there was to quote Shakespeare, they campaigned a little bit too much, actually. And um, I think that rebounded a bit on the councillors. Um, having finished the house, I've had exactly the opposite reaction from neighbours. They all love it. Murphy's use of concrete, levels and geometric shapes were inspired by the late Italian architect, Carlo Scarpa. Even here, out in the garden, there is great attention to detail. A 
walk from top to bottom helps give the visitor a better idea of all the details of the house. Richard Murphy has lived in his house for two and a half years now, and he wouldn't change a thing if he had to build it all over again. Well, longevity is a rare feat in the field of product design, and it's, of course, any designer's dream that their creations have the staying power of something like an Ames or a Barcelona chair. But some pieces are indeed made to stand the test of time. And this year, it's the Italian brand Cartel that's celebrating 50 years of its perpetual bestseller, the Componibili Container. Here's more. This plastic barrel is celebrating its 50th birthday. This classic of Italian design has held its own in living rooms and office spaces around the world for half a century. Milan-based architect and designer Anna Castelli Ferrieri, who died in 2006, designed the much-loved storage unit in the 1960s. What happened during this period? Our perception of space and time changed just as it has today. People wanted functional but flexible furniture. The round container became more popular than its four-sided predecessor. Anna Castelli Ferrieri's granddaughter, Loretta Luti, works for the Italian brand Cartel. That's where her grandmother was creative director when she designed the Componibili. My grandmother, Anna Castelli Ferrieri, was a strong, confident woman. She was the first woman to graduate in architecture at her university in Milan. She always said, you can do anything. You just have to be confident in your ideas and have the desire to implement them. Componibili means modular. The large units are made up of small individual elements, which can be taken apart at will. The Componibili allows you to divide rooms up in new ways. In the 1960s, the Componibili was something totally new, a real innovation. Living spaces were getting smaller and more people were living alone. The Componibili were very easy to rearrange, to suit any atmosphere. That explains the success they enjoy right up to the present day. Cartel has a flagship store in London. To celebrate the 50th anniversary, the company invited 21 renowned designers from all over the world to develop their unique take on the original. Here's what Fran Hickman came up with. My style as a designer is very much driven by my clients. The inspiration for the unit came from a house that we're working on. Try to express the spirit of the house. So it's just a juxtaposition between a kind of white, pure form and joyful 60s psychedelic color. Italian Piero Lissoni's design was inspired by the American expressionist painter Jackson Pollock. Lorenzo Luti is delighted by the multitude of ideas for the anniversary exhibition. Spanish designer Patrizia Orchiola is featured as well. This is a true work of art. The little Componibili practically explodes in a very modern and contemporary interpretation. We have a very eclectic collection, which will then come to Milan. Here is another dazzling version of the Componibili. The object from Philip Stark is very exceptional. He uses gnomes as the pedestal and turns it into a little table. It's really fun. One of the Componibili seems to smile. This creation of Fabio Novembre, the Componibili Smile, was the starting point for the entire exhibition with all the beautiful variations. It's the only one that will go into production and will be available to the public after Christmas. 
The Componibili, a design classic that's made for our time. Well, that's all for this edition of our highlights. So hope you enjoyed it. And until we meet again, alles Gute aus Berlin. Tschüss und auf Wiedersehen.